Thank you so much for being here tonight, being part of this class in the auditorium. Grateful to have everyone here with us. We've been studying They Struggled, referring to great men and women of faith in the Old Testament. We struggle. We go through the very things that they went through back at that time, and yet they were found faithful. And so we need to remember that, understand it. We need to gear ourselves to live uh, according to that. These were not superheroes back at that time. They were not individuals that wore the big S on their chest and with a cape. Uh, they were just ordinary people. But God did extraordinary things through them. And it was because they were willing to listen and obey. And we need to remember that in our walk also today. Men like Abel and Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In my eyes, these are giants. But they're giants because they did the things God wanted them to do. They're men and women of renown. And you can put uh, uh, Sarah and uh, Re uh, Rebecca and Rachel and Leah in that group also of people that did as God wanted them to do. They had their struggles, but they overcame those. So the person we're going to look at tonight is Joseph, and he certainly had a few struggles along the way too. He's no different than what they were. He had his struggles, but he overcame them, and he lived such a good life that the many people compare him to the life of Christ. Now, he would probably be embarrassed that people do that. Because he wasn't perfect, he fell short. But there's many people that will look at the life of Joseph and make good comparison to the life of Christ. The story of Joseph is found in Genesis 37 through chapter 50. So chapter 37 through 50. So much is written about him and his life. But tonight we're going to focus on Hebrews chapter 11 verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. You know, he knew the promise. He had probably heard his father talk about it and his grandfather talk about it and maybe even his great-grandfather. I don't know how all that extends. You know, you can take the genealogy and look at it and it's amazing if there's no skip generations in the genealogy that it is totally possible that Abraham, if there's no skip generations, Abraham could have actually sat on the knee of his whatever grandfather back, Shem, and heard the story of the flood firsthand because they would have been contemporaries if you take just the genealogy with no skips in it. And so I'm going to try to do something tonight from the outset that I'm going to apologize for and say it may be impossible for me to do this, but I'm going to give it a shot. And that is to talk about the life of Joseph in just one lesson. Because he had such a wonderful life and so much time is devoted to him that we probably won't be giving it enough, uh, not only historical uh, look at, but from the scriptures also. He turned his struggles into victories. I read a book one time, Turning, stars, Turning Scars into Stars. And uh, it was a beautiful motivational book about overcoming adversity uh, in your life. Joseph did that very thing in his life. His struggles came to him in very different ways because often he was innocent of any wrongdoing. And yet he found himself, through the lies of others, through the deceit of others, paying the price for something he didn't even do. But even so, in his life, it deserves our investigation because it was a wonderful life that he lived. So let's briefly look at it. There were only two sons born to Jacob and Rachel. And that was Joseph and Benjamin. So since Jacob loved Rachel, and we know that story, we talked about it last week, 
Of all the sons that he had, who do you think he favored the most? You think it was equal? David, you said it, what, what was it? Joseph, he favored more, and Benjamin. He loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. We looked at Leah's qualities last week. And she really deserved more than what she got there. But again, you see the flaw of favoritism. Joseph isn't going to be treated very well by his other brothers, at least 10 of them. They're not going to treat him very well. I think it's worth noting that once the brothers did what they did to Joseph, and we'll get to that in a moment, but you know the story, whenever they beat him and threw him in the well and sold him into uh, slavery, when they did that to Joseph, I think when they went back and told Jacob what had happened to Joseph, the made-up story, Joseph, uh, Jacob thinking that Joseph was dead at that time, I think they saw how much that really tore their father up. And I think they went far out of their way to protect Benjamin from that point on. And I think that's evident later on how much they wanted to protect Benjamin. Uh, maybe just maybe Joseph brought some of that resentment on himself, although I'm apprehensive to say that. But some will make the point, and this is where that kind of comes from. Whenever Joseph had his uh, dreams, and so let's go through those dreams just real quick. So Joseph has a dream, and he tells, shares it with his brother. What was the dream? There was actually two of them. Bow down to him. In what form was the, was the dream? Okay, okay, you both got them. Sheaves, somebody said, all right, and on the same row. All right, sheaves bowing down to the one and then the stars bowing down to the moon. So, no, what is it, sun? Okay. Now, he's telling me that. He's correcting me while I'm up here. But he had a whale tail on uh, the overhead today. So I'm not, I'm not even going to listen to him on that, all right? Uh, Jonah and the whale, right? Because he watched Veggie Tales. <laughs> no, uh, so don't ever, don't ever do that again. Right? <laughs> no, okay. So you had you had these two dreams that are that took place, but Joseph's the center point of those. Now, would you like it? I, I can go ahead and tell you, I would not. If one of my brothers came up to me and said, yeah, one day you're going to bow down to me. And even if he didn't say it like that, even if he says, I'm just telling you what God said, I'm probably still not going to like that if, I'm not going to like it the first time, but if he says it 10 times to me, I'm really not going to like it. Now, we got to remember Joseph was young. And there's immature things you do when you're young that you're not going to do when you're a little bit older. But I don't want to suggest that Joseph did something in an immature way. He simply may have been doing exactly what he was supposed to do. When we look at the story, we may say, well, I wonder why he went up and told them that. Even Jacob pulls him aside and says, now, do you think I'm going to bow down to you one day? Now, when you ask a question like that, see, we weren't there listening to it. Do, hey, Joseph, come here. Do, do you think I'm going to bow down to you one day? Or, Joseph, come here. Do you think I'm going to bow down to you one day? See, there's two ways. It's kind of like when you're texting. You get a text from somebody, or it can be an email, I don't care. But you get, you get something from somebody and it, it, it just says something like, uh, are, are, you, uh, are you coming to the house today? If it has a question mark there, you might read it. Are you coming over to the house today? I need to know because I need to get some things ready if you're coming over. But if you read it with an exclamation point at the end of it, it'll say something like, are you coming to the house today? 
That's two different ways to look at that. One is with an exclamation point. And unfortunately, a lot of times people don't put the uh, question mark or the exclamation point. So when we read it, I may read something and say, hey, Judy, can you believe what this guy said to me? And Judy's response to that is, well, wait a minute now, does it have a question mark or an exclamation? You read it like it had an exclamation, but I bet it was a question mark. So when Jacob says this to Joseph, he may very well have been saying to him, am, am I also going to bow down to you? But I want to tell you probably not. He was probably saying to his young son, do you think I'm going to bow down to you one day? And I think that makes all of the difference in this. But I don't believe that Joseph was arrogant in what he was doing here. Because when, why would God give a prophecy to somebody and then expect him not to tell somebody that prophecy? When God gave prophecies, those were declarations that they were, or proclamations they were to make through the declaration, all right? They were supposed to tell people what was said. So really, Joseph was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing whenever he said that, I, I believe. I don't think it was done in an arrogant way. If it was, he was wrong in doing that, wasn't he? But if it was done just simply to tell what had been said so people would be educated on that, then he did exactly what he should have. But don't forget, he was young and probably a little immature when at at this time in his life, so it could have been the other way around. So we know the story. Joseph goes out. He has the, the beautiful coat on that has been given to him. Coat of many colors, as we call it. The brothers see him coming from a distance. They begin to plot, and the plot is not nice. Uh, the plot is to kill him. Reuben, I believe it was, inter interceded in that and said, you know, let's not do that. Let's not go that far with it. So they end up beating Joseph and throwing him in the pit. And then when the Ishmaelites come by, and there they are again, we've talked about them several times. The Ishmaelites are going to uh, be a thorn in the flesh to the Hebrew people. All that came about a few generations before when Abraham took Hagar, and from that union, Ishmael was born. The Ishmaelites are going to take <clears throat> Joseph. They're going to transport him to Egypt. They're going to sell him to Potiphar. And Potiphar sees just how brilliant this young man is. He sees just how talented that he is. What a hard worker that he is. He had a great work ethic. Joseph did. People noticed. They noticed the day if you have a good work ethic. They noticed if you're lazy and try to get away with things. And they noticed if you're a hard worker. Um, in 1979, I worked in St. Louis at a furniture factory. And um, I got bumped up pretty well during the time th that I was there. Um, I had a friend named Danny, and Danny worked there also. But Danny liked uh, to take little naps during the day, and so he would find little places. It's a furniture factory. There's plenty of places you can get back in. And uh, he would uh, find a place and take a nap, a uh, five-minute, ten-minute little rest in the back. Danny was never going to get bumped up because uh, they knew he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. They just couldn't catch him at it. But they knew he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. But people noticed that. One of my biggest regrets working at that furniture factory, because I, I wasn't going to do that the rest of my life, but there was nothing wrong with working at the furniture factory. And it was a good job. And I probably could have had that job every summer that I went to college. When I came back, I probably could have. They would have hired me for the summer each time. But because of what I'm about to tell you, uh, one day I was in the back of a trailer and I was moving stuff around and we were all talking about our job and we weren't being real kind about the job that we had. And all of a sudden I'm just going 
about how much I didn't like that job that I had. And I noticed everybody shut up around me. Nobody else was talking. And as I'm moving stuff around and, and complaining about my job, I heard one of my worker, fellow workers go, <clears throat> you know, clear their throat. And I thought, oops, I have just been caught. And I slowly turned around to see the foreman looking right at me. He began to tell me what he thought about what I was saying. And from that point on, I thought, you know, I'm not going to be able to go and ask them for a job in the summertime. I was so embarrassed by that that I wouldn't go and ask that. Joseph wasn't like that. Joseph was a person who a Potiphar placed way up here and put him in charge of his whole household. So it was really sad when Potiphar's wife made advances toward Joseph. Joseph did the right thing, didn't he? He rejected those. And it seems like it happened more than one time in scriptures. But Joseph is still going to find himself in prison because a false accusation was brought against him. So, take off your shoes and put on Joseph's sandals. And you're in prison and you know you're completely innocent. What's your attitude going to be? Yeah, sure it is, isn't it? I mean, you're going to be upset. You're going to be, this is not fair. The world's turned against me. We might be all right with some of that, but we got to be real careful. And Joseph was, he never blamed God. And I think sometimes we might would want to say, God, why'd you do this to me for? Because in Joseph's case, he seized the moment. To teach people about God, even in that circumstance. And I don't think we're fully aware of the opportunities that are presented to us to teach people about God. I know I'm ashamed sometimes that I, I've had people come over to me and that literally ask me a question about the Bible and me answer the question. And it's a minute and a half or two minutes later, I'm thinking, why didn't I elaborate? Why didn't I say this also and this also? I've seen people who were very good at that. Just bump into somebody. I had a friend that was a preacher. And um, we were riding around in a van one day. And we pulled up to a stoplight. And there was some people. I was, I was driving. He was on this side. And he rode down his window while we were at the stoplight. And started talking to the people that were four or five feet away on the sidewalk. And in the conversation, he introduces Jesus to them. And he talks to him a little bit. The light's getting ready to change. I don't know whether to go or to stay where I'm at. Uh, but he invites them to church while he's talking with them. Just a little thing that he did there. My mom was really good at doing things like that also. Uh, we need to seize the moment uh, to teach people when the opportunity is presented to us. But I know good and well, Joseph pleaded his case. I know he didn't just go through just want, talking about God and all that. He wanted out of that prison. And the Bible even tells us a couple of times when he made the plea to somebody. Uh, remember the butler and the baker? When you get out, will you let Pharaoh know about me? Because he was innocent in prison. I think sometimes we put Joseph in prison and he's just completely content with prison life. Just going through life quietly, doing his task that were put before him. But I believe he pleaded his case and it's because of those times I've made mention of that I believe it was probably even more than that. But at least those times, the Bible does tell us about him. But even as an innocent man, he didn't blame God. He still gave God the glory, even in prison. So I think we can learn a lot from the life of Joseph and his story in the Bible. And to kind of wrap up the story, we know eventually he finds favor with Pharaoh. 
we know that he's released from prison. We also know that he's going to rise to power. How did that come about in the story? Logan, you want to answer that? No. How, how did that come about in the story? He, what did he do to get him in that position? Interpreted a dream. So, so they, he interpreted that dream. So in, through the interpretation of that dream, he's going to be released uh, from prison. Um, he becomes a hero, doesn't he? To the people of Egypt. Now, this is not an Egyptian. He becomes a hero to these people. It's through the interpretation of the dream that Joseph is going to store food back. And he's going to do it for, I think it was seven years. I could be wrong. And uh, after the seven years is over, he's going to, um, they're going to start delegating that food out. Eventually, his brothers are going to come on the scene, and he's going to have to help them with food. So um, all that's to God's glory. By the way, just because he was eventually released doesn't mean he wasn't viewed with suspicion either in our modern day society if a person commits a crime and is put in prison when that person is eventually released it's sad that we do this but we do it if something else happens similar to what that put that person in prison we might say oh you know, he went to prison for doing that very thing. And we look at that person with suspicion. Well, is God happy with that or not? You know, to me, I, I don't see how, God, I don't see accusing someone of something that you don't know that they did, how God would be happy with that. I, I think we need to be real careful with doing things like that. It doesn't have to even be prison. It can be um, a child that decides he needs the $5 that's in his mother's purse. And so he takes it. And the mother finds out and disciplines him. And the next time $5 isn't where it's supposed to be, the mother may jump to the conclusion that he took four, five more dollars. And again, we need to be careful uh, with that. Even in the church today, we see struggles with that. A person has been a good Christian, walking the way they should. They stumble along the way. We're supposed to rally around them and pick them up. And uh, they repent of that sin that they've committed. And sometimes, unfortunately, um, we might elbow each other and say something about what they did two or three years ago. Now, did anyone say, ouch, did I step on your foot? Because I did on mine, all right? And ouch, it hurt, all right? I've done that. I shouldn't have, but I've done it. I've thought, you know, and then I had to stop myself. And I had to say, no, no, well, you, you don't have the right to do that. You don't have the right to say that. And so we need to be very, very careful with that. I want to give you just uh, quickly, well, anyway, Joseph ends up becoming second only to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. And eventually he's going to help his own family out who comes to him for help. I don't want to get in that, that part of the story so much because I don't want to miss the benevolent heart that Joseph had, even toward those that did him wrong like his brothers had done him. But even in the church today, I don't think sometimes we have the benevolent heart that we need to have. In reading Paul's writings and looking at what Paul says in, in, in Scripture, if anyone had the right to claim spiritual royalty, uh, you know, it, it kind of was Paul, wasn't it? 
I mean, he doesn't even like to brag, and he, we're not really supposed to do that. But you can be pushed into a corner to such a degree that to defend yourself, you're going to have to come up and say, well, wait a minute now. And that's what Paul does in Scripture, uh, in, um, in the Bible. He's kind of pushed into a corner. So he has to go through a litany of things. And one of the things is he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why would he say that? Why would Paul say, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin? As if to get applause for that. Why would he say that? Sweet. <laughs> I'm left-handed. So I'm with you on that. All right. um, why would he say it? Another reason. Yeah, okay. They were, uh, there was only two tribes that, that remained loyal longer than the other ten split off and went to the north. Two southern tribes were Judah and Benjamin, all right? So um, that's, that's one of the reasons, okay? The other reason is Benjamin actually, Judah gets credit for it because Jesus is going to come through that, that group, the tribe of Judah. But Benjamin was so small that Judah kind of swarmed around it. So no longer was it being referred to as Judah and Benjamin, those two tribes, but it was just kind of referred to as Judah, even though Benjamin was part of it. But in actuality, it was the tribe of Benjamin that remained loyal the longest. And so the beautiful thing about it was Paul was saying, basically, you want to challenge me, you Hebrew people? I'll, I'll play the game if you want to do that. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. In essence, we remain loyal to God longer than any other tribe. He went on to say um, several other things that uh, kind of, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, I'm a Pharisee, and he went through all these different things that he was. And then another time in scriptures, he goes through uh, also telling about all the th ways he's been punished along the way. Again, a beautiful uh, writing in the Bible. So if anybody could claim this, it would be Paul. He's one of the most humble people you'll ever read about in scriptures. He wasn't boastful. He didn't brag. He was very humble in his approach, very benevolent toward others along the way. And it's somebody that we certainly can look at and, and, and see just how great he was. And Joseph was a lot like that also. We sometimes talk a good talk, but when it comes right down to it, we suggest that no one took care of me while I was growing up. Well, that's not the truth. But we'll say sometimes, I did it this way while I was growing up. Why should I have to take care of somebody else along the way? That's not a very benevolent attitude to have. My parents raised me this way. They told me to work. If I didn't work, I shouldn't eat. Why should, we have to take my, why should I have to take my money and give it to that person? That's not a very benevolent attitude. The reason it's not is because every person in this room at some time has tripped up, messed up, stumbled, and not had the things that you needed at that time. And to push people away from you and not accept their help along the way is not what Christ intended for us to do. He intended us to rally around each other to strengthen each other and build each other up. Now, it is true in the Bible that the Bible does say that, doesn't it? To the Thessalonians, Paul makes a plea to the church there because, now I want you to listen to this. He doesn't say don't help others along the way. He says if they're not willing to work, they shouldn't eat. Now don't take that out of context that it was given in because I'm going to ask some questions to get ready to answer, all right? Why 
did he have to say that to the Thessalonians? What was going on in Thessalonica? At that time, with some of the members of the church that caused Paul to say, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. He'd come and they'd missed it. But yeah, well, that's part of it. So what did they do? They thought, he's getting ready to come back. So what did they do that caused Paul to have to say this? They stopped working. So they're sitting around waiting. Now, that was a handful of Christians back then that did that. The rest of the Christians kept working. And what had they become to those people that were still working? What had the ones that stopped working become to those that were still working? Busy bodies because they had a lot of time on their hand. But they became a burden, didn't they? They became a burden to those other people. They had the ability to work, but they had stopped working. And through the stopping of their working, they now were relying on the ones that still were working for their meals. And that became an extra burden on those people. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is if a person comes up out here who has just been let go of their job, who does not know how they're going to pay their rent. Who has a little child in the car with them. Who's not even asking for stuff for themselves, but for their family. How dare we not help that family? But we do here. We try our best to help them. And yes, it's, it's fine. I think it's, I think it's showing good stewardship to maybe even get some information from the person and get their name and address and different things. To have that information because if they come in two weeks later with a completely different story, you know, um, that may help us understand But I just see Jesus and what he did while he was on the earth. And I hate getting taken advantage of. But I'm, I'm wor it's worth it to me. It's worth it to get taken advantage of. To know that I helped a person who really needed it. So out of ten times, maybe two, two times I get taken advantage of. But it's worth it to me because... Those other eight times, we helped somebody that really needed that help. Oh, man, I could talk for hours about this because I've been around it all my life. I've, my dad was a preacher, and I've seen those stories, and sometimes I was so mad because I knew the person was taking advantage of my family. But my dad would say, uh, you're going to have to get, work your way through that. Because, yeah, they may actually be taking advantage of you. But if they're not, you just really help somebody who really needed that help. Y'all have thoughts on that? Yes. Well, I think if, you, if you're involved in it for very long, at a time, you become cynical, much like the world. But I'm, I'm like you, I think help someone if you were in doubt you help them and then if they're pulling a fast one on you you just have to tell yourself that God is going to take care of that on down the line uh, we have to do what we need to do and uh, whether that's whether they deserve it or not you, you're going to get snookered sometime I mean there's no getting around it and, uh, but God knows He's going to have the final say so. I'm just kind of, I, thank you. I'm kind of haunted by, in the scriptures, you know, the, the scene that's depicted about 
when I was thirsty, you didn't give me any water. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I needed shelter, you didn't give that to me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I, I, I'm kind of haunted by that because I think far too often we want to dismiss people out of the, the realm of that and we want to act like we're, that's all right, we're doing fine because we're doing all these other things. We go to church, we do all this other stuff. But that's part of this, helping the ones that are in need and needing help. Um, Joseph was like that. Joseph was a person that seemed to go beyond even in helping people. And I'm going to tell you, Pharaoh did the right, he picked the right person for that job. He had the perfect person uh, to do that. Um, you know, uh, I have stories in my mind of, about times that we've done something through this congregation. And I just want to share one with you that we did the other day. Uh, you know, I've been collecting the money for the gift ministry. And so I had the opportunity the other day to take that up to the school and to give it to uh, the principal from Higgins. Now, those that are in here, Logan had to write an article that explained the acronyms because sometimes we have acronyms for things and, and we forget what they mean and who the programs are for. And gift is gathering items for teachers. G-I-F-T. Gathering items for teachers. Gift. So we started that ministry with the thought that we were the ones going to go and get the items ourselves. And we were going to find out from the teachers what they needed in the classroom. We were going to go buy the supplies and supply the classrooms. But it became apparent fairly quick that it made a whole lot more sense if we simply gave the teachers a gift certificate to the school supply place in Tyler and that they knew better what was needed in the classroom than what we knew. So we kind of switched it up a little bit into it and we started giving those out. Well, this year it was Higgins' turns because we've been taking them alphabetically. So we started with Brown, went to Kane, now we're at Higgins, Stanton Smith next year, and we'll jump over to ETCA the year after that. So we've got that list of schools that we're doing that for. So Higgins was this year. So I found out through Judy uh, that um, through their principal, Mr. Kaiser, that how many teachers were in the school system at the elementary up there. And so I kind of calculated in my mind, and anyway, we needed to raise $2,000, and we hit that quicker this year than what we'd ever hit it. So it was going to be $50 per teacher on a certificate. So I had him the other day. Man, that took a long time for me to tell you that, didn't it? I had him the other day, and I went up to the school, and I went up to Mr. Kaiser, and we talked a little bit, and the secretary was standing there, and he was standing there. And I said, well, the White House Church of Christ has a ministry. I'm not going to go through it again. And, and here's uh, what we collected. And here's 44 uh, gift certificates to the school supply place, $50 a piece. And his eyeballs were that big. I mean, he just, and he took a step back, and the secretary was saying, oh, my, you know, and, and what, that's the greatest thing. And... They went on and on uh, about it. Who did that? You all did that. And not doing it for a slap on the back, none of us did it for that reason. But just that was acknowledgement enough of a, of a good job. Don't, please, don't grow weary in well-doing. That's a good ministry that we're doing don't grow, grow weary in well-doing. And be benevolent in your approach to others along the way. Will there be a time in your life where uh, somebody comes up to you and needs help and you're not going to be able to do it? Sure. 
uh, one, of, one of the programs that I've enjoyed the most, and I've only, only actually done it once or twice, is what Logan started through the random act of kindness. You all still have those cards? That's an ongoing thing now, so we haven't made mention of it lately. But that random act of kindness that Logan um, started with those cards, uh, we can still be doing that, helping people along the way, not expecting anything in return, just doing something kind for somebody else. It's a great way to introduce them to Christianity too and to the church also by doing that. I could probably ask David how many people he's had the opportunity when he's teaching them how to shoot a gun out of his little uh, his range out there, how many times he's been able to introduce them in a subject about Christ while he's out there. Seize the moment. Seize the moment along the way to bring Christ into the conversation also. By the way, we can give them, just like Joseph was doing here, we can give them all the physical food that maybe they'll need. But if we don't introduce them to Christ along the way, we're not giving them that spiritual food uh, that they need. Do you have any thoughts or comments? So that's a little bit different of an angle there on Joseph. Yeah. What's really interesting to me about the story of Joseph is that the amount of, of ink that is dedicated to him and you think Moses or somebody else might have the most but you go count the words you'll find out that it's Joseph what a great story of somebody didn't get treated right got uh, pushed around a little bit more than he should have and yet it all comes true, the prophecy that he made. It all came true in the end. And like I said at the beginning, he's one of the people that we make a comparison to Christ uh, because of the life that, that he lived. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, thank you for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you for the blessings of this life. We pray, God, that you'll continue to help us to grow through the knowledge of your word. And as we obtain that knowledge that will, in a way, uh, make the application to our life that's necessary to help us grow in your love and in your kingdom. Give us that spiritual wisdom and understanding that comes through your word. Strengthen us that we'll make the right decisions along the way. And in the end, please help us to hear those words, enter in thou good and faithful servant, in Christ's name.